Hello and welcome to painting a pastoral portrait of a dog. Uh, today we're going to be doing a chihuahua, which is a commission for a client. As you can see, I've started off by going in with sort of a mid-tone colour and I'm getting in the details of the dog. I usually start every portrait drawing a line where the centre of the eyes go, eyes go across the middle of the, uh, the canvas. This way I can make sure that there's going to be plenty of room for the rest of the dog if I just get the eyes in first. And I also try and get them sort of in the middle or slightly above the middle line in every portrait just because they tend to look better if they're positioned there. So here you can see I'm doing the, I've got the ears in there and the, the line down the edge of the dog. Sometimes it's easier to put in the facial features first and other times it's easier to do the outline. Um, it just depends on the photo really. This one, this dog has a lot of small features that are quite close together. So sometimes if I'm painting, I will, I won't do the outline. I'll just go straight in with blocks of colour. But because this dog has such a, a detailed little face, I wanted to make sure I had everything in the right place. So I'm drawing in, as well as drawing the features, I'm drawing the shadows and highlights the shapes of them so you can see the eye there in the middle and then I've also got the little yellow eyebrow and then I've drawn in the the line across the forehead that's kind of it's just where the coat's glossy but I've drawn it in and I'm working my way around the muzzle just making sure the nose is in the right place making sure it lines up with the eye above it gone back to the other one there and then we'll put the mouth in so these details can be quite rough to begin with as long as they're basically in the right place everything's adjustable and I tend to adjust fine details towards the very end of a painting anyway but it does make life easier if you can get them in the right place to begin with so sometimes I'll just do the face and the shoulders or chest of a dog. But this one I've chosen to include that little bit of the back and the leg that you see. I just thought it would look quite nice in this portrait. So now I'm using the same colour that I've done the outline with, but I'm starting to block in the sections that I can see it in the picture. Um, this is often easier to do with a highlight or a shadow, but this this colour was quite prominent and I could see it in quite a few places so I decided to put that in there first. Very rough at this stage. Usually I use the pastels on their side as well in the beginning stages just to really get a good block of colour in. Now we've gone for some yellow. So all these colours that I'm using I can see them in the portrait but quite often um, I'll saturate them a little bit. So by the end of the portrait, you end up with quite a vivid looking image. So just picking out any little bits of that mustard yellow I can see in the photograph. I find that I often, if I choose a colour for one part, I will then, instead of putting that colour down and doing another part, I will have a look and see all of the areas I can see that colour in and the whole photograph and put them all in at once. It tends to make your painting quite coherent at the end. It kind of gives it, um, well, it basically creates a palette without you having to think about it too much. So now I've gone in with a really light pale yellow and I'm just going for some highlights on top of the yellow that I've already put in. It doesn't take very long before you start to see a three-dimensional dog starting to appear in your painting especially if you're if you're working on a colored background so my canvas here is pastel matte and I've gone for quite a dark green background um, just because it's a dark dog and it's easier to put highlights onto a dark background it's only got a few white patches on it but as you can see there it's already starting to kind of pop out a little bit if you're working on a white canvas that would take you quite a while 
So this is quite often the stage where, because I'm putting in blocks of colour, a few of the features I start to realise that they're in the wrong place. I'm constantly taking little measurements in my head of, you know, what's the distance between the corner of the eye and the nostril, or between the eyebrows. Little measurements all the time. Where does the mouth come against the eye? It goes about halfway across in the photograph. It's still just blocking in really rough sections of colour though. It usually takes quite a while before I actually use the end of the pastel. Quite a lot of time spent just using it on its side. That canvas as well, pastel mat, I use it for all my pastel paintings. It's brilliant. It, it's got it's got a tooth on it, but it's not um it's not you can't feel it too much. It's it, you can definitely feel it's there, but it's not like a sandpaper and it really does grab pastel really, really well. I don't use anything else. You still you get a lot of dust still though. So now I've gone for a pink. There's quite a vivid pink inside those ears. And that was where it was obvious to me, so I put that one in first, and now I'm looking in a little bit more detail at the photo to see if I can pick it out anywhere else. Just so that it becomes part of the colour scheme of the whole painting, and it's not just a random blob of vivid pink. That technique can work the other way as well, if you want something to really stand out instead of using it instead of using a colour all over a painting you can purposefully only use it in one specific spot and it will stand out there's slightly more detailed colour blocking coming in now but it's still mainly highlights and shadows or extremely vivid colours that I'm putting in all the obvious stuff everything that pops out to you is the stuff I'm going for. I'm not really seeing it as a photo of a dog at this stage either. It's just blocks of colour and shapes to me at the moment. When I'm focusing on a painting that is all I see them as for quite a lot of the time actually. I don't see it as a whole image that I'm trying to make look like a dog. I'm zooming in, figuring out the shape of a certain section of colour and just blocking that in. I only really see it as a dog when I'm, if I'm checking details, like checking that their eyes are level or that their nose is in the right place, or if I'm at the stage where I'm trying to put some expression into the face. That's a good time to uh, to see it as a dog and there's little tips and tricks as well for uh, getting them getting them to have certain looks it's really interesting how how different a face can look just with a slightly different mark just the, the angle of the corner of the mouth or eyes are quite a eyes are quite a good one you can uh, really really change the expression of an eye just by slightly raising sort of one end of it or um, where you choose to put a highlight you can learn to manipulate an image so even if your reference photo isn't brilliant this one I'm using here it's okay but it's not particularly well focused so there's not a lot of detail in there um, but once you get the hang of drawing dogs or animals that doesn't matter so much. You can kind of um, use previous experience to make a portrait. So all of these colours that I'm putting in here, they are colours that I can see in the photo, but obviously they're more saturated. And all that really matters is the values of the colours that I'm using. So I want to make sure that my highlights and my shadows, you know, it could be, they could 
be a pink or a blue but they've got to have the right depth they've got to be dark enough or light enough or saturated enough to either come forward or go back in the image and that's the trick really if you're going to do paintings that have a lot of color in them you, it's all about learning color theory all about color values saturation A good trick if you're beginning to learn to do that if you're trying to add more color in but you're not really sure if the colors that you're using are working you can do so much to a portrait take a photograph of it and then turn it into a black and white image and if it's in black and white it makes it a lot easier to see if a color is actually working and if it's if it fits in the image how you wanted it to if, if you put a blue in there that's too saturated um, once you've turned it into black and white it will be too dark and it will sink sink back in your image into a shadow so as I'm working through these colors you see my marks start to get slightly more accurate I'm not I'm not quite as fast now as I was at the beginning I'm taking a bit more care to put these finer marks in the right place So here I'm using a deep red colour just to put in some shadows. Once you've put in your extreme highlights and extreme shadows, that's when your painting starts to look a bit more three-dimensional, a bit more of a form to it. And when I started painting here, I realised that every colour that I'd used so far was really warm, so reds and yellows, creams, some pinks. So I've got this lovely greeny blue sort of a mint color now just to cool some of the areas down a little bit and also to tie it in with that background color I hadn't decided at this point if I was going to keep that the background color but if I did it would go very well with this green So this green that I'm putting in here, it's quite a mid-tone, but it's working nicely as a highlight on the dog, on that coat sheen that it's got across its forehead. But all the time I'm comparing the values, so the green that I'm putting on now, I'll, I'll be comparing it to the yellows that I've put in there. Um, it's a little darker in person but you can just about see here where the green and the yellow are obviously very different but they have a very very similar value they're both light the green's just slightly darker which is what I wanted if you look at the photograph the yellow's a bit brighter so just picking out any tiny little bits now where I can see that colour even if it's not completely the same colour, if I can see the pigments of it in any part, I'm just blocking them in. Quite often I'll put them in and then it won't, I'll go back with another colour and go over the top of it, but I won't use um, enough pressure that it covers the original green, so you'll get some of it coming through if you have some sheer layers um, later on in the portrait. It just gives it a bit more texture. Going back in with a few more highlights now, just picking up some details on the nose. I always try and um, avoid using black as much as possible as a general rule, but if I do use it, it's usually for the eyes and the nose and the mouth, sort of details like that. I try not to use it straight away. I try and get a basic, basic form in before I go into the eyes. 
Um, even though they are my favourite part, they are usually the thing that brings a portrait to life. I always try and hold back a little bit um, before I go in and do the black details on the eyes. And eyes are a funny one as well. Um, they're another thing that I don't. I try not to see them as eyes. I try and just look at the blocks of colour that you get in the pupils because you would think that it would just be colour around the edge of the pupil and then a black pupil. But that's hardly ever the case. Um, there's usually deep turquoise and blues in there. Really, really, really dark pinks. Um, and even when you're doing them, they can look a bit not quite right it's usually the usually when you put the highlight in right at the end that's when you know if it makes sense as an eye or not so i've literally just done some black in that one i think i'm going to do yep yeah, i go and do the other one now and then i'll try and pick out some color so usually dogs have brown eyes um they sometimes show up as like a mustard yellow in sunlight so I, you, quite it's quite nice to just get a highlight in there of the actual color of the eye because you can't often see it but it just gives a hint of what color the eyes actually are it's so just putting some darker details on those ears now this is quite an unusual dog for a portrait really no, normally they all follow set kind of dog face rules but chihuahuas have got their own set of rules So just getting some of those darker shadows in now. I'll realise in a little while that that nose is too far to the left. If you line it up with the eye above it, the left nostril should be just below the eye, but it's actually further, it's towards the middle of the face. But that's one good thing about using pastels, you can correct things quite easily. Oh, here's Peach. This is my uh, kitten Peach. I've only had her for a few weeks, she's a bit of a rescue. She was skin and bones when I got her, but now she's a chunky little thing. and She's very, very confident. She loves getting in the way of me painting. So one thing you have to watch out for when you're portrait painting, if you've got a dog like this that's got um, the yellowy orange tan markings, obviously on the dog that's all one colour, but that colour is going to look different depending on where, whether it's in light or shade. So if you look at the photograph, the middle section of the yellow cheek that kind of goes around the edge of the mouth that is sort of the medium yellow but then that same yellow just to the left where it's highlighted with the light shining on the cheek of the dog has a very pale um very pale yellow and then to the right it's got the other extreme where it's um like a almost like a, a burnt orange or a um an ochre color but that's all one colour on the dog but that's learning learning to saturate or darken or lighten in colours is what's going to make it a lot easier for you to create realistic portraits just about reached the stage in this portrait where usually for, for quite a while they'll go quite well because it's basic blocks you're putting in so you can't really pick up any details that are wrong but I'm just getting to the stage with this one now where you can start to see things that 
needs slightly shifting to the left maybe or making slightly larger or smaller. But that's just part of the process. I remember when I was first learning to do them, or I am still learning, I'm always learning. When I was first learning to do portraits, you, you're really aware of all the, the sort of calculations that you have to do all the time in your head. So you're always working out, you know, is this the right color value? Is that going to make, is that going to make that part of the dog sink back or jump forward into the foreground? Is it going to be a highlight or a shadow? Um, so you've got your colour values, you've got actually having the ability to put them in the right place um, and draw the shapes accurately that you can see. And then you've got your spatial awareness as well. So constantly, I'm not re I'm very rarely aware of it. I'm constantly making little measurements when I'm painting. So if I'm drawing an eye, I'll be measuring the tiny little distance between the pupil and the edge of the eye or the eyebrow, I'll be measuring, you know, how far up the eye it comes, or just const constantly measuring everything, cross-referencing everything in the image to make sure that everything's the right scale. And it's, it's just the sort of skill where after a while it becomes second nature, but to begin with it's really hard work and it's, if, you might be aware of it, but it doesn't mean that you can do it, like you have to work on it. Practice makes perfect, I guess. And to begin with as well, you'll 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 draw something or you'll paint something, and then you'll kind of take a step back from it, and you'll realise that there's something glaringly obviously wrong. Like your one eye will be a whole eyes a whole eyes size above where it needs to be, or something. So you have to make a big adjustment, either get rid of it or even start again, depending on what what materials you're using. But as you get better, these little adjustments, you, you still have to make them all the time, but they're tiny. So they're a lot easier to do. You know, they're usually a few mil here or there. Um, or it's just a, a few shades lighter or darker in a colour. So it just becomes easier you actually get quite quick after a while. It used to take me days to do paintings but now it's I'm down to hours now. It just be, it just becomes quite natural. So you can see now I've got in all of the all of the major blocks of color everywhere, all of the major shadows and highlights and so now I'm really going in a bit more detail with a lot more different colors. Just picking up on finer little, um, finer little colours um, that I'm picking out of the photograph. So to begin with, it was just blocks of yellow um, and that sort of mauvey, purpley colour. Now I'm going in with a variety of pinks and oranges and reds all into one section. And you'll find as well. Um, if you want to learn to paint like this, you'll start off with really big blocks of colour and the longer your portrait goes on, you'll be making smaller and smaller marks as you build up the layers. It's kind of, it's kind of all in layers. Um, which is nice, it gives, a, it gives a nice finish to paintings. But then I've got to the stage with my painting now where I don't like it to be uniform so I'll get to where it's almost looking complete and then I'll re-look into the photograph and try and find sections that have a big block of the same colour so, and then I'll go on top of all the detailed lines I'll put my pastel on its side and just try and make some interesting marks some big marks bold A lot of people tell me that they have issues with um, worrying about ruining an artwork, basically, especially if it's going really well. 
they're scared to, to, to try anything new or do anything a bit risky in case they ruin the artwork. And I think that's one of the worst things you can do as an artist is be too scared to try new things or just be worried to ruin something. Um, quite often progress is made when you try something new. I remember when I was at art school, um, we used to have life drawing lessons once a week with a model and we'd all stand around the model with our easels. And one week we were all working and our tutor gave us 20 minutes to work on our own paintings, which is usually about the time that you start to, you know, you start to actually see something in your work and you're getting a little bit pleased with it maybe, or getting a little bit attached to it. And then our tutor told us to drop our materials and move to the easel next, next door and work on our neighbor's portraits. So we did this for the whole lesson. Every 10 minutes we were moving. Um, and it taught us that we shouldn't be too precious about our work because funnily enough, when you get moved onto someone else's portrait and you have to work on top of their work, you're not attached to that painting. So you're not afraid to just potentially ruin it or try new things because you're not, you don't, you don't feel precious towards that painting. Um, so that was a good lesson and that's stuck with me for years. I, I talk to people about that lesson all the time. I think it was such a good one. It taught me a lot because I would quite often get to a point in a painting where I knew it wasn't finished but I was too scared to try the thing in my head that I wanted to just in case I ruined it. But you can't, you can't ruin it. What's the worst that can happen? You, like, you start again. It, it, if you have that mentality, it enables you to work more freely. You'll have a much freer style and more confident marks because you're not overthinking every single mark that you put onto the page. It's one of the reasons I work in pastel. Um, well, the main... I'm <laughs> Originally, I was an oil painter, but I live on a narrowboat. You might be able to tell from the video. And um, the table that I work on, the dining table, actually drops down into a bed as well. So when I set up to work, I like to just set up and then be able to get straight into it. But with oil paints, you have to set up your palette. You know, it's just a whole... It's a bit of faff. And uh, you can't really stow them away like you can pastels your paintings need to be dried and everything so that's one of the main reasons why I got into uh, soft pastels and I love them they're so quick that you know you don't have to mix any colors you can just see the stick in front of you figure out what value you need or what color and you can just use it and you can build them you can mix them together to an extent to make new colors um, but I just like how quick they are and it it gives you, because you're not having to stop and mix colours, you, you can just work more freely. Um, it's more spontaneous. And it's easy to correct, you don't have to wait for anything to dry. And Peach is back. She quite often just sits behind my easel. Here you can see I'm working in some more subtle shadows just to create a little bit more dimension and detail um, in things like the dog's eyebrow sort of ridges above the eyes. One thing you have to be careful with as well when dogs have markings like this quite often i will see um yellow tints in for example the part to the left above the eye which is actually that gray grayish coat color and i can see yellows in it so i want there to be yellows in it but i'm not sure if you can see very well but i've put a very very dark ochre yellow there I will also have to be careful that that doesn't end up looking like it goes with the tan markings on the dog. I'll have to make sure that that is the right colour to just look 
like the darker colour on the dog's coat, otherwise it will lose its markings. You can see the dog Milo in the background. Okay, so here where I'm putting in some of the mid-tones in these features, this is where I start to fine-tune um, the drawing, I guess, of the painting. So I'll be constantly taking little measurements in my head, just making sure that there's the right distance between the edge of one line and the start of, say, the eye. Um, I think I might be putting in the lines for the muzzle here. I see a lot of pet portrait artists who um, they will draw it all out very detailed to begin with in pencil, usually. Or sometimes they'll they'll use a um, um, a projector and basically trace it onto the canvas first, and then they'll start at one side of the canvas and just fill in the colour and all the detail as they work their way across from one from one side of it to the other. And it takes hours. And uh, they can look very nice. They're very detailed. Um, some of them almost look like photographs. But then it's that whole argument of, well, if it looks like a photograph, then what's the point in it being a painting? Aside from the skill and time that's gone into it, it's not... It's trying to replicate the photograph. So I'd much rather, I'd much rather paint in a way that's... Um, completely different to the original image I want it to, I like to try and strike a balance between you know you could definitely pick out that it was the dog in the photograph everything's in the right place and it makes sense but then I want it to be interesting I want it to be vibrant and full of interesting marks Otherwise, it might as well just be a photograph, in my opinion. I used to work quite a lot um, with scale grids to mark up a portrait to begin with. So I'd grid up my photograph and then figure out how much larger or smaller I needed it to be on the canvas and then I'd grid up the canvas and then carefully draw it using all the squares but um, I'd quite often just go in after that and just start working like this anyway so after a while I just well it didn't take long at all actually I stopped using the grid method um, I used to just draw and then go in with colour but now I find it much easier if I just go in with blocks of colours just to get the basic outline. It quite often helps as well if you're, if you're first learning to draw with sort of blocks of colour instead of outlines. If you half squint your eyes at your photograph, it blurs out the details and you, you can just see it for the highlights and shadows and blocks of individual colours. So if you sort of squint at your photo and then go to your canvas, that can often quite help um, with drawing the initial layout of a portrait. So looking at the painting now, you often reach different stages in paintings um, and it's just starting to make quite a bit of sense now. But this is also the part where you start to see where you've got mistakes. So you can see as I start putting these really finer details in, I really, really slow down from how I was working at the beginning because I'm actually having to stop and think and figure things out a little bit before I make any marks. I think I'm just adjusting that nose a little bit. I've realised it's too far to the left, so I'm starting to shift the whole thing to the right now. So 
added a little blue shadow into that white there. You can see there's just the slightest shadow on the reference image. It's funny, sometimes when you're working it just seems to either keep flowing naturally or every so often you'll come to a point where you stop and then you'll just take a look at the whole image and there'll be something glaringly obvious that you've missed but because you've just been you haven't been looking at the whole thing too much you've just been focusing on one spot you just, it just goes unnoticed hopefully you realize before you get too close to the end So this is where you can start to put in some of the expression of the dog. The reference image, it's got quite a smiley little mouth. I haven't quite haven't quite got that the end of the mouth turned up just enough yet in my painting. But I'll realise that soon. And I'll start to just add a bit more um, deeper colours. Just to turn the lip up a little bit. So sometimes when you're altering little details like this it feels like you're kind of sculpting with the paint because you've already got your base image down so then just to alter the shape of things you'll just get a slightly different tone or a different color and just carve along the edges just to slightly change little details here and there and slowly it just starts to make sense and to actually look like the dog in the image and not just a dog. So I've just slightly brought out the muzzle of the dog there a little bit because I realised it was too close to the face. I'm just going back into those yellows with some slightly different yellow tones. I find the more um, variations of a colour you put in, the more interesting a portrait you're going to end up with. My aim always is to have an image where if you're looking at it close up, you can see all of the marks, all of the colours, all the, all the just subtle little mark making. But the aim is to, when you move back from the image, it all just works together to make it coherent. It's almost like an optical illusion, really. Here you can see I've got quite a deep tone blue and it's just adding some darker spots but they're not as dark as a lot of it. So it's just filling in the gaps between the harsh, so it's not as harsh between the darkest and the lightest colours. Kind of bridge the gap between them, these nice colourful mid-tones. I 
I find as well when I'm doing these portraits that um, you get an eye for it, but uh, basically I'll work for a while and then I might realise that the overall colours of a portrait are too, there's too many blues or too many purples and it makes it look more abstract if it's all kind of too much in one spectrum of colour. So then I'll intentionally pick one that's the opposite side of the colour wheel and um, just try and pick out some details in that, even if they're just slight little hints of that colour. Once, once you've built up your layers and it's all been added together, it just makes it makes more sense of the image and it kind of stops it being one colour all over. With pastels as well, because you're not having to mix the colours, I do find that I end up going back to the same sticks quite often, or at least I use... There's probably about 10 sticks that I use in every single portrait. So they always start off in the in the wooden box on the right and then they gradually all end up on the foam boards in front of me. I also realised recently as well that I purposely, if I'm drawing a dog or an animal, if it's brown or black or grey, I will, for as long as I can, I will avoid using the obvious colour. So if I was doing a chocolate Labrador, for as long as possible I would avoid using browns. I'd build it up with reds and sort of burnt oranges. Um, try and get some nice greeny blue mid-tones in there and then only towards the end will I allow myself to use greys and browns um, and I'll try and be quite minimal with them as well because even though that is the colour of the dog it's I'm not I'm not trying to accurately accurately represent the colours that are in the photo I'm trying to I'm trying to make it more interesting than the original photo and I find if you avoid using colours like greys and browns, that's easier to achieve. Grey can sometimes help though. It could be a nice, um, it can nicely balance out the colours. If it's all looking a bit too um, abstract and vivid, some nice middle grey tones in there can make it work a lot nicer. So as I was saying before, you kind of go through phases with every portrait. To begin with, it's all just, you know, it's just blocks of colour, so you can't really make much of it. And then it's exciting when it first starts to take a bit of form. Um, and it tends to be a short period of time where it's just exciting. It's really good. Everything's working. Every mark you make is adding something to it. And then I quite often get to a phase like this one here where I'm starting to think, oh, is it still working as well as it did? Because quite often um, the early stages can actually be make a really interesting paint and painting and I'm really tempted to leave them um, sort of as a finished piece really while they're still quite sketchy. But you just kind of have to power through it. This is what I was saying about uh, not being too precious about your work and just having the confidence to keep going. Because uh, once you get through this phase here, often I'll go through a patch where I'm thinking, oh, I might have ruined this one. Um, is it worth me carrying on? Should I just stop and then start again afresh? But 99% of the time I keep going and then it gets into the next phase where everything starts to work again. You correct some of the mistakes or add a few details that were needed. And it's a more exciting stage 
people often ask as well how you know when a portrait's finished. Um, I was doing a live, a live um, demonstration the other day, and one chap said, "Oh, is that finished now then?" And I said, "No, I've uh, I've got lots of details to put in yet. I was still I was still mostly using the pastels on the side at that point, but it looked like it could be finished." Um, but I said, no, no, it's not ready yet. I'm just going to keep putting in more detail. And it just builds up a nice layer, a nice, nice depth of picture. So this part here, you can see I'm just doing some of the background. And um, I don't actually keep it that colour. But it was, it was just playing on my mind a little bit. Um, if you're drawing a dog, you want them to sit forward from the background. And as a general rule... If the edge colour is light, you're going to need a darker background, or if you've got a dark edge, you need a lighter background to make it pop forward. The only thing is you have to make sure that the background colour is less saturated um, than the one in the actual portrait of the dog, otherwise the dog will either look flat against the background or the background will actually stand forward of the subject. So there I was struggling a little bit because a lot of the tones were the same as the background so I quickly just blocked in a lighter colour just so that the dog popped forward a little bit but that's not the colour that it ends up being at the end because it didn't quite work the way I wanted it to I wasn't quite happy with it funnily enough grey is often quite a good colour for a background uh, because it naturally just sits behind everything Sometimes I use grey pastel mat. That's often the tricky part as well. If you're going to use a pastel mat that's coloured and you're going to choose one like this, where it's quite a dark colour, although it can be quite helpful if you're if you're doing a dark coloured animal, um, it can be quite tricky to do the background sometimes, just to find a colour that's muted enough to sit on top of the green. I think my favourite colour of pastel mat to work with is um, the light grey if I'm doing dog portraits, um, unless it's something like a black Labrador. If it's a black dog, it's got lots and lots of dark colours in, I'll usually start on a dark blue or a dark green or dark grey background. Um, if I'm doing a portrait of a person I'll usually use like a cornflower colour like a pale yellow coloured background to start with it's very 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 rare that I start with a white background and if I do I usually block in a load of colour immediately like straight away when I'm doing the initial blocking in of the subject I'll do the background as well the background's more important than you realise Getting the right colour for the background is really key to making a portrait work. So here you can see I've really slowed down quite a bit. And that usually means that I've got to the stage where most of the colour's blocked in, so this is usually the part where I will start going in and maybe making some more interesting marks to show some hair or um, quite often I'll go back in and put fresh highlights on top or um, if you if you're looking at a photo quite often you'll think that there's actual blacks and whites in it but there aren't really. Usually it's just a very, very dark colour for the blacks or white is usually just a very, very diluted colour. Yellows and blues usually. Um, and I try really, really hard to avoid using black and white unless obviously I use black quite a bit for the mouths and the nostrils and the eyes. But if you try and restrain yourself, it gives you the ability to use them more towards the end 
especially with the whites for highlights if you've got a whole image that doesn't have any white in it if you then use a white as a highlight for say an eye or a nose or a particularly white patch of fur it has more of a it it has more of an effect because you haven't you haven't got that tone anywhere else in the image so it pops as a highlight but if you go using blacks and whites quite regularly all the way through the image it doesn't stand out as a highlight because it's you know it's everywhere you can see here I've just realized that that chin's not quite the right shape so I'm just going back in with some different colors going over the top of some of it just to shorten the chin a little I would say at least half of painting a portrait is this stage where you're just going back into your work checking all your measurements realizing any little pieces that aren't quite right and trying to correct them That bit I realised I'd missed part of the highlight on the cheek. And again on this nose, I went back to this nose a lot. The majority of dog portraits that I get commissioned to do, the dogs are face on. Um, and they've got kind of very uh, symmetrical faces dogs have you draw a line down the middle of the page and that's basically your nose is going to be there and your eyes are going to be equidistant apart from the nose but when they're at an angle like this it's a little bit more tricky um, especially this dog's got very small kind of neat little nipped in features so all the measurements are really really subtle it doesn't have the usual long snout of a dog so something that probably wouldn't be so obvious on say a picture of a Labrador or a hound um, tiny little measurements make a big difference on something like this So just putting a few more shadows on that white chest there with a nice blue. As I said earlier, it doesn't really matter what colours you use as long as they've got the right values. Um, but there are general rules. So generally on a white coat, if there's a shadow, it tends to be a soft blue or a lilac. I'm going back into that background now because I wasn't happy with it. So I found a colour that was more like the original background colour but still light. Um, just to block it in because it was distracting me. Quite often as well with the background I'll block in colour like that and then I use my fingers to smudge it so that it doesn't have... Um, so that it's all one flat colour um, but then often once I'm happy with the colour I'll go back onto it afterwards and make some marks with the pastels on the side just just to give it a bit of texture really or sometimes I'll get another colour that's very close to the background colour I've used and make some marks with that I'll quite often go around the edges of the image as well and if there's parts that are kind of uh, not standing forward of the background colour as much as I would like I'll find a close colour for the background that's either a couple of shades lighter or darker depending on what's going on with the image and I'll just make a bold mark next to the dog in that colour just to make it pop forward and just to make the background a little bit more interesting without it being too distracting it's rare that I'll just have a background that's one solid colour, unless unless I've 
used a pastel map that happens to work with the whole image, but that's quite rare. Just slightly altering that white patch on the dog's chest there. quite limited to the hours that I can um, work on my boat because I need natural sunlight to do it because the the lights on the boat are very they're lovely it's a really nice atmosphere to live in but they're very warm so they're not they're not great for uh, painting and doing portraits because it doesn't really show you the colors as they are so you can spend hours on a portrait at night and then wake up in the morning and look at it and it looks completely different and it's all wrong. So, especially in the winter, um, now that the clocks have gone, my working hours are massively shortened compared to what they are in the summer. So I don't quite, don't quite get this one finished by the end of the video. But um, if you want to see a picture of what it looked like, if you nip to my social media pages, that's Emma Schmidt Fine Art on Facebook or just Emma Schmidt Art on Instagram. I'll post a photo of it on there for you to see. You'll be able to see it a lot better on there as well. Um, the colours on this video are slightly more muted than they are on the actual portrait. They all seem a lot paler. It's a bit the whole thing's a bit lighter. Um, and also you'll be able to see all the marks properly. Uh, all the little detailed pastel marks. You can see me hesitating a little bit there. I'm start I was starting to uh, run out of daylight a little bit and I was quite aware of it. So I didn't want to do too much work on it and then have to correct it the next day. So there's not too much longer until I stop working on this portrait for that day. But if you've found this educational or interesting or you've just, I don't know, maybe you've just had a cup of tea and sat and watched me paint a dog for an hour, let me know in the comments. Um, if you've got any questions or requests for other tutorials that you'd like to see, maybe a bit of colour theory or um, just maybe some people portraiture or different animals, anything really, if you've got a question then just let me know down below. Thanks for watching my first tutorial video, it's been a pleasure.